So, um, you know, normally when I speak, um, you know, there's the usual um, long talk and then some questions at the end, but I think that with this... Oh, here? Okay. Okay. Um, you know, it seems like with a, a group like this, it would be better to make it a little bit more conversational. So uh, instead of a, a long lecture and then questions at the end, I, I think it's better if we do it that way. Um, so um, besides, you know what? What? Oh. Ah, yes. That's a great design for a microphone, you know, tossing it around. That's, you know. Shall I give it to you? Uh, <laughs> no, you just have to know how to shoot straight, you know. Yeah. Um, so um, I don't have that much experience with Bitcoin, uh, although I do have a, a, like a, a, a tiny amount of Bitcoin that I kind of keep as a pet rock. You know, I, I, watch, I watch it go up and then I watch it go down. And so um, it's, not, it's not where my uh, retirement fund is, though. Um, I, uh, Hal Finney was a, a good friend of mine. and, and uh, he had some Bitcoin in the early days that uh, was worth about a dollar at one point, and he was amazed that it had become so valuable that it was worth a dollar. Um, and, and so he bought a TV for his family uh, in Bitcoin at about a dollar a Bitcoin. A nice big flat screen TV, you know. So I, I, back in December when Bitcoin was at its peak, I was wondering how how much that TV was worth. <laughs> um, so, um, I, you know, I could talk about I, maybe the early days, the PGP days. I, you know, I, I, I wasn't really that much of a part of the cypherpunks. I, I kind of worked alone in Boulder, Colorado. The cypherpunks were over in California. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and I wasn't quite as radical as a lot of them were. I, you know, I, I had a wife and two children and a mortgage, and uh, I, you know, I always wore a suit when I was being interviewed by the TV or something like that because I wanted to stay out of prison and I wanted the audience to sympathize with me. Um, so, um, what do you, what do you guys want to hear about? Um, what's the subject matter uh, that's most appealing here? I mean, um, about um, the steps leading up to thinking about making PGP, and then uh, the reasons for inventing PGP, and um, then the process of creating creating PGP. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I could talk about that. So PGP was a, was from the beginning was a human rights project. Um, I had. Um, been, been a peace activist in the 1980s. I, I did. Um, uh, I taught classes in military policy uh, to train lobbyists to go and and try to persuade the U.S. Congress to stop the arms race. Um, and um, I, you know, I became an effective speaker on military policy issues. Um, and I also did civil disobedience. I was in jail with Carl Sagan. Uh, also with Daniel Ellsberg. How many people here have heard of Daniel Ellsberg? Uh, probably most of you were too young to know who that is. He published the Pentagon Papers uh, in the 1970s. And so, you know, he inspired me about civil disobedience. So um, that was my first taste of civil disobedience. And uh, my wife also went on Mother's Day and got arrested at the Nevada nuclear weapon test site where I got arrested on a, on a different day. I w was in jail twice, actually. And, um, and so that was, you know, PGP was in the context of that kind of activism. Um, <coughs> now, like every other engineer you've met, 
engineers are such pathological optimists when it comes to estimating time required to finish something. And I was no different. Um, so I didn't realize it was going to take so long. And I missed five mortgage payments uh, writing it. I really developed a lot of skill in negotiating with banks to not lose my house. <laughs> um, and so the first version of PGP uh, was published in 1991. And before that, it was, not, um, it, it was not possible for ordinary people to communicate over great distances without the risk of interception. Um, sovereign states could do that. Um, and, uh, and, and they, you know, they would, they had such enormous resources, they could send people carrying keys to foreign embassies. Uh, but ordinary people did not have that ability until PGP in 1991. Um, the first version wasn't that great. Um, so the second version came out about 15 months later and it was considerably better. It had a trust model, had a better encryption algorithm, and um, it was more like what you see today. Um, and at the, you know, at, at that time, the Cold War was ending and businesses were starting to become more globalized. And, you know, there were, there were the, the need for PGP for businesses wasn't as great when it first came out because um, businesses were mainly protecting themselves from other businesses. And other businesses did not have any significant cryptanalytic capabilities. And so it wasn't so important for them to have anything stronger than 56-bit DES for encryption. And, um, and so uh, my threat model was different than that of businesses in 1991. It was to, in order to protect human rights workers and political activists, um, their adversaries were major governments. And so their threat model was quite different than businesses trying to protect themselves from other businesses. But as the 90s unfolded, and you know the Cold War ended right at the beginning of the 90s, um, <clears throat> businesses became more globalized, even small businesses. And they you know, hired people in foreign countries um, where there was cheap labor. Um, and those same countries with the cheap labor also had oppressive governments. Uh, or maybe they were coming out of an era of oppressive governments uh, with the end of the Cold War. And so, uh, and so businesses started to experience the same threat model that PGP was designed for. And so it started to become more appealing then. Uh, during the mid-1990s, um, or uh, the early 90s up to the mid-90s, I was the target of a three-year criminal investigation because the government um, felt at that time that uh, encryption software really should be classified as a munition. And uh, you weren't allowed to export um, anything on the munitions list without a special license. Things on the munitions list were like, you know, Stinger missiles and um, uh, advanced weaponry and, you know, encryption software. And so, um, and so they were investigating me for violating the Arms Export Control Act, which the mandatory sentencing guidelines um, were 41 months to 51 months in a federal prison. So that was kind of a miserable period of my life. Uh, in retrospect, it was helpful to my career. But at the time, it was pretty miserable. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I had uh, a legal defense fund, and I had a legal defense team. I had several lawyers working pro bono. My lead counsel did require money because he didn't have a big law firm backing him. So we had contributions from all over the world and he, uh, and, and we worked hard for three years to try to stop me from getting indicted. And uh, I decided early on that it would probably be better if I did a lot of public speaking, which normally criminal defense lawyers never let their client do public speaking. But my legal team looked at this and thought carefully about it and realized that maybe in this unique case that maybe that would be a good idea. So I did. And every time I did, uh, I'd go to a conference and there would be someone from the State Department uh, taking notes. 
the uh, part of the State Department that enforces the, uh, the law that, I, that they claim that I broke. And, uh, and, and they also purchased the cassette of, the, of my talk. <laughs> um, so I was always quite disciplined in how I uh, gave my talks. <clears throat> One time I was invited to speak at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in, in uh, Georgia, the American Georgia. And, uh, and um, the, uh, the prosecutor wanted the wanted this uh, place to record my, my lecture so that they could use it against me if, if possible, you know. Now, this is Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. This is where all the cops go to school, you know. And, and, and it was a tough crowd. Uh, it was the most hostile crowd I ever spoke to. But they stood up to the prosecutor and said, uh, if we have to record him for you, we won't let him speak. And so they let me speak. They didn't record it. And, uh, and besides, I maintained the usual discipline. I was speaking in a room full of, of uh, federal agents. And uh, the last thing I was going to do was incriminate myself. So that was kind of fun. Um, when, I, when I got on campus, uh, they had a, uh, they, they, I saw that they were doing evasive car chases around this track. And, and I said, is it possible that I could learn this, you know? <laughs> and, oh, and then we went to a, a bar um, that night, or the night before, or the night after, and it was a cop bar, and all these patches from every police agency in the world who had trained there, well, not everyone in the world, but it was, all the walls were covered with these police patches, and, and I asked the bartender, I said, do you ever get robbed in here? Have to be pretty dumb, right? Okay, so, um, after the criminal investigation was ended, uh, they did not indict me. Um, it was still against the law to do what I did. Um, but it, at least at that point, I could start a company. And so I moved to California, started a company, raised venture capital, and uh, tried to turn it into a commercial product. Um, after a couple of years of that, we sold the company to Network Associates. Uh, after a couple of years of that, they sold it to another startup that was buying the assets of PGP to make, an, make, make another try at it, PGP Corporation. After a much larger number of years of that, they made it successful and sold it to Symantec for $350 million. I didn't have much stock at that point. I, you know, Symantec is the fifth owner of PGP, so I don't know anybody working there anymore. They, all my friends left years ago. So, and I don't think they call it PGP anymore. They called it Symantec Encryption. I was thinking that maybe I could ask them for the trademark back. Uh, <coughs> maybe that could be turned into something. PGP is better. Uh, yeah, I was thinking a press release, PGP is back. Maybe I could fork some open source uh, Implementation of the Open PGP standard and Force GPG, I, converter. yeah. Um, so, um, but I, I I don't know who who to ask at Symantec. Um, but in the last 15 years, I've focused a lot more on secure VoIP, and haven't really thought that much about encrypted email until recently, and what kind of set it off recently was this e-fail vulnerability that came up. And, uh, and so I took an interest in trying to figure out how to mitigate that. And I, I think there's a need to improve the standard a bit. Um, it was designed so long ago, and uh, it needs to be updated. Um, so, um, so let's open it up for discussion. Uh, the code of PGP, you printed it in a book as well. Can you explain about that and how that works with the law? Well, it depends on which book you're talking about. Um, uh, during the criminal investigation, I was at um, DEF CON, and I ran into uh, someone from MIT Press. This was in 1993, um, and he, or maybe it was 94, I'm not sure. And he said, uh, 
that he would like to publish the PGP user's manual. And I, I thought, okay, that sounds like a great idea, but I'd like to also publish another book through MIT Press, uh, two books. Uh, the other book would have the source code to PGP. And, um, and I would try to pr make it in a nice OCR font. Um, and the idea was to use it at trial if I was indicted uh, because uh, there was this very interesting litigation going on. Uh, a guy named Phil Karn, who worked for Qualcomm in San Diego, had gone out to uh, a bookstore and purchased Bruce Schneier's book, Applied Cryptography. And he wanted to, um, well, he did a very clever thing. He sent this book to the State Department and with an application to uh, export this book. This book is already exported. I mean, it was published by a well-known publisher. I don't remember who, but it was already all over in bookstores in Europe. And But he asked for a commodities jurisdiction, which was to, um, it was under the control of the State Department. And he wanted it declared to be under the control of the Commerce Department, uh, when, so it, it could be legally exported. And they looked at it and said, well, of course, this is a book. Why are you asking us such a stupid question? You know, and so they said, of course, here, you can, yes, it's, here's a, your commodities jurisdiction. What they didn't realize is that they were walking into a trap. And as soon as he got that um, from the State Department, he then took a floppy disk and he put it in an envelope along with another commodities jurisdiction request and sent that to the State Department. And the floppy disk contained the source code that was published in that same book. There was. In the appendix, there was source code for the Federal Data Encryption Standard. <coughs> and he just had that on a floppy disk. And he sent it to them. And of course, they said no, because you, know, you can't export software, encryption software. That was, that was the reason why I was under criminal investigation. And, um, and he said, well, why not? This is from the same book. You just approved this book. This is from the same book. In fact, it's not even the whole book. It's just the appendix. Um, and they said no. And uh, they realized that they you know, had walked into a trap. And, uh, and so while that was happening, I got approached by the editor from MIT Press uh, who proposed this book idea. And I said, well, here, how about this other book too, which would have the entire source code for PGP version 2.6.2, which was the current version of PGP at the time. And um, MIT Press, would, as soon as they had printed the book, they applied for the same thing that um, 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 sorry, I, I'm drawing a blank with the name. What? Phil Karn, yes, Phil Karn, I'm sorry. When I was younger, I didn't have these problems with names so much. Anyway, I, see, this is being recorded, so Phil Karn might see this, and I hope he doesn't, because <laughs> anyway, I remembered his name a few minutes ago. So um, this was gonna be a repetition of the Phil Karn thing, except that this time the State Department knew, you know, they weren't gonna be caught in a trap. They knew what it was about. When MIT Press applied for commodities jurisdiction for that book, which had all from top to bottom, including the make files, you know, everything you need, right, for PGP 262. Now, that version of PGP was already all over the world, so there was no need to scan this book. But the idea was we wanted to put the State Department in this predicament. And so they asked the, they asked the NSA, and the NSA said, well, <clears throat> whatever you do, don't say yes. Uh, and so, but they knew they couldn't say no because this was a book by a prestigious academic publisher, MIT Press, you know. They couldn't say no. There was serious First Amendment problems with that. And they couldn't say yes. So they didn't, so they didn't respond. Meanwhile, MIT Press shipped the book all over the world. You know, they didn't wait. Um, and, and so, um, you know, 
we were hoping they would say either no or yes, because if they said no, that would actually help me at trial, because it would turn it into a First Amendment case. And if they said yes, well, that would also help me at trial, um, because it's, it's obvious. It's <laughs> yeah. So, um, and they knew that if they said yes, that we would send them a floppy disk saying, well, how about this? Um, and so that was what was in that book. However, we didn't expect that to ever be scanned because it was already all over the world. There's no point in scanning it. But after they dropped the case finally, and I started a company, we um, took all the source code for the new product, which was quite a bit bigger. I mean, the book from MIT Press was like 800 pages. The new one was 5,000 pages <coughs> and took many volumes. Um, and also, it was in a better OCR font. Um, and so, um, we sent that book overseas. We knew it was legal to export books. So we sent that book to Europe. And people in Europe scanned it in and discovered that it's actually very hard to scan C source code. Um, because OCR scanning software uses spelling dictionaries to resolve ambiguities from the OCR. And spelling dictionaries are not going to help you much for C source code. Um, sometimes they would even drop characters, you know, like, you know, asterisk slash. Um, it would just drop that. It thought it was dirt on the glass or something. Bill, how uh, did this strategy come into being? Where, I mean, was there some discussion where you were well, sitting around they, the table? Because, because, you know, we had such a good time with the MIT press book, which was not a serious attempt to scan anything. The, the, even in the beginning, the first the MIT press book, how did that, you know? Oh, well, that was just a serendipitous thing. You know, Bob Pryor from MIT press approached me at DEF CON in 94, maybe. It's ac by accident, then, that this happened. Well, no, I mean, in, in his mind, it was not, I mean, he wanted to publish the user's guide. He didn't think right, about right, the source right, code right. book. Ah, exactly. He just wanted to publish right. the user's guide for PGP. So then, so then the, um, was there, a, was there a, a time where you were sitting in a, in a cafe with, the, with your lawyers and said, hey, why don't we do this? No, instantly when he said that, I said, uh, yes, we can publish the PGP user's guide, but I want a second book published with the entire source code to PGP. As soon as he said, you know, oh, he's from MIT Press, he wants to publish a PGP user's guide, instantly, instantly. I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm under, you know, threat of imprisonment, you know. I mean, this is, I'm thinking all the time, what can I do to, you know, increase my chances of not going to prison, you know. So as soon as he said this, I thought, okay, let me just, okay, we're going to publish a book with all of this. I knew about the Karn case, you know, the Karn case was very interesting. And I knew that, you know, the Karn case was really stirring things up and putting the government in a difficult position. In fact, the government was a defendant. You know, I, by that time, I think Karn had actually sued the government. He had gone through various administrative appeals. They said no, they said no, they said no. Finally, he's, he sued them in federal court. So they were a defendant in, the, in his case. In, it's civil litigation, not criminal. So, so a little bit of a digression. I mean, this is a Bitcoin Wednesday. So. Um, um, this is the kind of thinking that we could use because we are, it's a case of history repeating itself in terms of regulation. You, you, do you understand what I mean? Or we can give you a little bit of background? Um, yeah, I, I don't So we, know. We, feel, we feel that, um, that, that a, a transaction, cryptocurrency, is the same issue. It's freedom of speech. It's the, you know, and, and it's become a money laundering and anti-terrorist uh, financing issue instead of a f ability to innovate and to transact and communicate with one another trustlessly through the blockchain or through a distributed ledger all over the world. So even if we wanted to have even a, like a non-fungible um, uh, token to play a video, to play some type of interactive game using the blockchain, because it has the word blockchain and cryptocurrency associated with the regulator's mind, we would have to, um, well, uh, relinquish our privacy. We'd have to do, go through anti-money laundering. We'd have to do a, a know your customer regulations. These are the proposals that are all, all being, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Right, uh, first of all, it's an honor to meet you. 
and that's something I would say to very few people, and it sounds like you've been in jail with a few of them, so after the cameras turn off, maybe we'll hear about that. But um, to specify this a little bit, is when I think of, okay, I, I can give you a concrete, concrete, concrete example where that goes wrong. For example, we have uh, huge housing problems in Amsterdam. So the uh, living corporations, they build houses and rent it out to people, usually for social purposes. Their business process is fixed. So you could code it out instead of like put trust people in, in the position to fuck it up. And like that would be called the autonomous living corporation, living building corporation. And it would run independently and it could even subvert pieces of legislature. So to, you're, to you're describing an application better. for um, a, some kind of cryptocurrency. I'm, I'm describing an, an autonomous entity which uses a bunch of smart contracts and perhaps multiple cryptocurrency ledgers, so chains that have computed, distributed computing power. And this entity that is created, it has the ability to map towards legal entities and through that mapping affect the real world in the same manner that companies do. Yeah. Using shims, like using people as shims that don't have much authority themselves. The Dutch government has, has very far stretching powers for arranging setups like that. So I'm, I'm positive that within the current legal framework, I could implement the replacement for most public services and many corporate services and then some very communist like mechanisms for discovering new products and, and then exploiting the production of them. I could just implement them and make them compatible and competitive <coughs> under current governments. But yeah. do you think it's corruption or ignorance? Um, for why? What you mean? With, what with your experience with PGP, it should have been clear to most of the government that code is speech. <coughs> that code is something you can communicate, that therefore it's in the domain of private communication, that therefore you cannot prevent its spread like that. And similarly, we've now arranged for money, that's what Richard was referring to specifically, is we've arranged for transactions of money to be able to be performed within the domain of, of you know, something you could put into a letter and, and mail. A lot of these mappings that I talked about before depend on outputting blockchain data and giving a notary a contract, a physical, like a, a, a recording contract, which forces him to interpret the other paper documents with blockchain information. I think in practice they'll probably yeah. sleep over it and use software. But there's, there's a lot of things you know that, that, that are currently done in, in the real world with paper that, you know, that are using analog techniques that could be um, carried out in a different way with blockchain. Exactly. So. Um, uh, that's true. You know, and, and most we, of the government structures, they depend on trust persons to execute stuff that we can now automate. And the amount that we can automate and fix with cryptography is, is so large that most of the government systems, which are 1700s technology, they can just be updated with the same principles and probably perform much less scary. You know, I, I would like to caution that smart contracts have to be written with utmost care because if you can't take them back, if they're really automated, if, you know, that could one produce one, that could produce very uh, painful, that is, is painful like results. <laughs> so if you, um, we have open source repositories, but if you would hold them on Ethereum, and any patch to it would be accepted by the holders of the utility token that guarantee access to it. Perhaps you'd even use digital rights management that only token holders can access the software and access <coughs> the source code. This would preserve open source standards values and liberty values, mm -hmm. and still allow for a rather traditional open source model or is a rather traditional business model for open source software. So that would be called democratic software because people who use the software have an equal vote in how it's written. And that might allow more precise and updatable code, which would still be on chain. And EOS is an experiment right now where it imports American politics, which is an idiotic plan to try and like fix the mapping between code and what people intended in, in a traditional legal manner, which I think is just really stupid because it's like so much shit you're importing. Oh, okay, I, I, yeah. I, I think that th this might be worth you giving a talk on this at some point. <laughs> well, the fundamental question is, do you think it's ignorance or corruption? Do you think they'll try to prevent me from doing this? I think what he's asking is, why does government try to ban crypto? Please speak into the microphone, Harry. Right now, crypto is widely deployed and it's entrenched in a way that 
we can't go back. I mean, every browser has TLS. All of our online banking and e-commerce depends on it. Um, we have all kinds of crypto and all kinds of things. It's embedded in our smart credit cards. Uh, it's the, you know, the foundation of, of all banking today. Um, we can't go back. The government uh, does accept it. I mean, I, you know, I, I built products. I told you I was working on secure VoIP the last 15 years. I built products that do secure VoIP that you know SEAL Team Six uses. Um, and uh, in fact, <clears throat> I would argue that um, that any attempt to stop that kind of technology would be undermining. Um, you know, our, our spec ops forces that need to use this kind of technology in the field to kill bin Laden, you know? Uh, so, you know, crypto is everywhere. Crypto is, everybody depends on crypto. And the military buys commercial off-the-shelf products now. Uh, they, we can't stop crypto. This is not the 1990s. There is some pushback now re-emerging from governments because in particular, we're doing end-to-end -end crypto now. Uh, TLS is, you know, client to server. When we do it end to end, it seems to be activating um, the um, objections of law enforcement now. And so um, we have to push back on that. I have a, a, a question. So you've tried several things. You tried uh, spreading PGP in a sort of decentralized fashion over the internet as a sort of activist to help your friends in the peace movement. You've ran a business uh, afterwards, and you've also were involved in a, the, I think, the Open PGP Standards Working Group, the IETF Working Group. I don't know if you have recovered or you think it was a good idea or a bad idea, but how do you, or what do you think was the most effective way in to spread encryption? And did you, do you think there was any utility of trying to have a unified standard called Open PGP? Well, okay, so that's an interesting question. Um, when you make standards in a way that they can be used by a lot of vendors who want to interrupt, uh, you know, you do interrupt testing, um, it means that if you ever want to make a change to that standard, there's a lot of inertia in the system because you have multiple vendors and you know, they can't all make the change all at once. Um, sometimes the urgency could pressure them to make the change faster, like if there's a serious bug that has to be fixed. Um, but th things that involve standards that lots of vendors are embracing and use it to interoperate, um, that can develop a very high inertia. Whereas if you have a monolithic system, like, um, you know, there was a time not so long ago when a billion people who used WhatsApp went to sleep with no encryption in the product. And when they woke up the next morning, there was a billion people with end-to-end -end encryption in the product. It was pushed out as a software update. A billion people overnight. Well, you know, maybe a couple of them took a couple of days to get their updates installed. But when you have monolithic control, um, you can update everyone in one software update. And that's kind of a nice luxury. Right now, you know, th this e-fail thing that came out, uh, a lot of vendors have, you know, there's, there's kind of a patchwork of vendors that have varying degrees of vulnerability and it's like herding cats to get everybody to fix it. So um, I think it's good to have standards. There's a place for that. But it does produce a very high inertia system. Um, you know, I had a lot of fun building a product that was monolithically controlled. Well, when PGP was mine, it was monolithically controlled. I ruled it with an iron fist. Remember the first time I went to a conference in Moscow in 1999, um, some guy who was formerly of the KGB, he was a cryptographer that came to IACR crypto conferences in Santa Barbara, and he wanted me to, he took me out to lunch and, you know, and he took me to his office and he pitched me on 
putting his and his block cipher into PGP. You know, and he and he opened his he had a closet in his office. He opened his closet. He had a KGB colonel uniform hanging in the closet. He was kind of proud of it. I mean, somehow he didn't realize that that wasn't the most persuasive technique to get me to embrace a block cipher that this guy had developed. I would have said no even if he didn't, didn't come from the KGB and even if he wasn't in Russia um, because I had pretty high standards for what goes into PGP. But I was kind of, um, I was kind of controlling it with, with an iron fist. And it'll, it'll, everybody and his brother was sending me, oh, I have this thing I invented in my basement. Could you please put this in PGP? And you know, the answer was always no. Um, on the other hand, there was um, GNU Privacy Guard, which at that time was new, and it was, you know, it was an open source project. And uh, because it's open source, every software engineer that that gets pleasure from writing software to in, implement some encryption algorithm was contributing it as code to an open source project. So GNU Privacy Guard was getting things that I thought shouldn't go in, like Blowfish. You know, Blowfish is a block cipher that has a cool name, but it was Bruce Schneier's first attempt, and it wasn't really very well analyzed. Twofish was way, way better than Blowfish, and, and that was part of the AES uh, competition in the late 90s. In fact, I put it in PGP. I actually put it in PGP like three months before the end of the AES competition because I was convinced it was going to win. And um, if only I'd waited three months, I would have found out, you know, it wasn't going to win. <laughs> the reason why, it, and I'm still glad it's, I mean, it's a great block cipher, but, but every time you put something else in PGP, it becomes a legacy burden. You, you have to de be able to decrypt files encrypted with that at 100 years in the future. You spread it so hard, you have no idea. Yeah, and, 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 and when you're doing a, a protocol that does uh, link encryption, like you know, TLS or um, SSH or um, some kind of open VPN or IPSEC, you can play around with different algorithms because each side says, here's what I've got on my menu. What do you got on your menu? Let's find something in common we can talk. So you can put something in experimentally and try it for a while. If you don't like it, take it out. And then it's harmless because now it's off the menu. That's link encryption. But with PGP, that's not how it works. You have the legacy burden pretty much forever. Um, and, and so uh, eventually, other implementations of PGP became available, including the new privacy guard. And so the more of those that became available, the more difficult it was to um, control uh, you know, what everybody was doing. So you know, it became just a subject of following a standard. Right. Yeah. I, I have a question. Um, considering uh, what you've been through the past uh, decades and the years, and uh, looking back at it, uh, would you do it all over the same? Yeah, uh, although, you know, I probably want to use better algorithms than the original PGP. <laughs> um, and a uh, follow up question um, in, with regards to. Um, Privacy. Uh, there are certain angles on cryptocurrency, uh, cryptocurrencies um, that are, let's just say, a little bit scary for a lot of uh, parties involved, especially governments, regulators. Uh, as we've seen uh, recently, that certain exchanges in certain jurisdictions they ban uh, privacy coins um, because of stated um, risks involved in it. Um, have you ever noticed or have you ever um, sat down and thought by yourself um, that the technology, the uh, cryptography that you created could also be used for bad reasons and in what way? Cryptography is often used for bad reasons. Uh, PGP is in the Al-Qaeda training manual. I wish that were not the case. Uh, but I can't think of a way to make it available to everyone without also making it available to the bad guys. So, I, I you know, I, I, I think that <clears throat> it's, it's better if you start treating this kind of technology as a mainstream technology. You know, you should behave as if there was nothing wrong with it. You should not run around 
acting conspiratorial and, and drawing the shades and whispering to each other in dark rooms about it. You know, you should just treat it like, you know, cryptocurrencies are an interesting technology and the free market will decide whether they achieve wide adoption or, or not. And, you know, encryption is used everywhere. I, I still get emails to this day, you know, from people that imagine that. I just got an email like yesterday from a guy who is still using PGP version 2.6.2 from 1994. And he said he's been using it all these years. And, and now he, he's stuck because he upgraded his, his laptop or something. Maybe, I don't know, he did something where it wouldn't run anymore. And, and I, I said, why, are you, why did you do that? I mean, it, it had algorithms that were bad algorithms. It had MD5, you know, the hash function that you know, was broken 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, you should have updated it. You're supposed to update, as, especially security software. You know, the guy, conspiracy theories can paralyze you and make you see the world in a very distorted way. Uh, n none of the conspiracy theories are true. All of them are false, you know? Every conspiracy theory in the world is false, left and right. Um, and, and it paralyzes you, and it means that you don't update your PGP software or any other encryption software or your operating system or whatever. PGP had some kind of special place in his mind that he thought, you know, when, when, when the government finally dropped their case against me, there were people that wrote to me that said that they didn't want to use PGP anymore because if the government dropped their case against me, that can only mean one thing. It means that they could break it. And that's the only reason why they decided to not imprison me. And, and so I, uh, you know, I actually felt pretty angry about that. You know, my God, I have to be crucified to satisfy these people? I have to hang on the cross for the rest of my life on earth, suffering for them to trust PGP? And if they ever release me from this torture, then they'll stop using PGP because that's a sign that the government can break PGP? I mean, what kind of crazy conspiratorial mindset is that? Satoshi is anonymous. Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Paul is saying it is ignorance. It's not corruption. It's not that there is a great deal of people interested in fucking with people that fuck with their stuff. It's that really people don't know any better. You mean for the 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 conspiratorial this conspiracy theorist for behavior? Example, when the police shot all those hippies, it was because they couldn't handle the situations any better. It was not because they just hated them. Well, no, I mean, um, yeah, police sometimes shoot people because of their mindsets, their prejudices. They err on the side of shooting someone. <laughs> That's not a, I don't think of that as a conspiracy. I mean, when I say all the conspiracy theories are wrong, it doesn't mean that there's no evil in the world or that there's no fucked up ways of thinking. What happened? This just stopped working? <laughs> Uh, maybe it's mute. Okay. Yeah. 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 Is a battery? Okay. I, isn't this a uh, microphone also? Did I turn off the transmitter in here? Leave that alone. Okay. I gotta hold the uh, huggable microphone. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people write to me about their conspiracy theories because for some reason they think that I'm going to agree with them because they're drawn to PGP and they think that if I develop PGP then I must have the same mindset as them. They've write, written to me about all, I've seen so many conspiracy theories of people writing to me describing their conspiracy theories to me, you know, oh, 9-11 was an inside job, you know, oh, uh, yeah, in fact, oh, the airplanes crashing into the buildings were, were empty, they, they had taken all the passengers off, and, 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 and so when I ask, well, 
well, okay, they, they took the passengers off before they flew the planes into the buildings? What? Well, well, then how come we can't find those passengers today? Oh, they had them killed. Well, wait a minute. Wouldn't it have been more efficient to leave them on the airplane? You, take, you fly the plane somewhere, land it, take the passengers off, then take off again and fly into the building, and then you kill the passengers? What? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean, on the left, on the right, conspiracy theories, I, I, it's, it's just, it's a horrible way to look at the world. And, it's, and, it, and it, it ends up electing uh, authoritarian governments. It ends up electing presidents who are absolute nightmares for democracy. That's the kind of thinking that leads to authoritarian regimes in Poland, in Hungary, in the United States. And it's just what Putin wants you to think. Oh, another one. No, yeah, it's worth it. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> if I start talking about trumpets, thank you. <laughs> you can get off stage now. <laughs> First of all, writing PGP, which is a really important tool for people to use. Secondly, the reason why we have cryptography uh, into the public domain and widely used. There are many different battles along the way, but that is a very important moment. And thirdly, about uh, code becoming a form of speech. I don't think there was any thing that made it more clear that that was our avenue as activists to be able to change the world around us through writing code. And um, are you aware also of, uh, of uh, how now that um, is being continued, for example, um, I, have in, I have a friend and he, he uh, made the plans to 3D print a gun design yeah. and distribute on the internet. Yeah. And the government uh, made him take the gun designs off the internet and now he's uh, suing the government for uh, under First yeah. Amendment. Um. I've been asked before to compare those two situations. I, I don't really think of them as the same. I, I think of guns and I think of encryption software in, as, as being in different categories. Um, encryption software is purely defensive. It, perhaps if you wanted to find a physical analog to it, perhaps body armor would be a better analogy. Um, it's, a criminal can wear body armor while he robs a bank. And then he can have a gun battle with the police and he's protected by body armor. So you could say that body armor can be used in a criminal way. But body armor is intrinsically defensive. It stops bullets. So it's, it's not about speech. So it's not, it's not speech. I didn't get to the speech part of it yet. Okay. I'm just talking about the differences in the technology of encryption versus um, uh, guns, uh, not, not the speech angle. Uh, I was planning to use um, the First Amendment uh, at trial if I was, if I was indicted. Um, but I don't think that freedom of speech is the only angle for defending uh, the, the right to publish encryption software. Encryption software also uh, does a, a, a public good. Where would we be in the modern world without encryption? You know, historically, governments uh, depended on their ability to cryptanalyze the, the ciphers of their enemy. World War II was in part determined by uh, cryptanalysis. The Battle of Midway was absolutely pivotally influence by breaking the Japanese codes. Um, World War II would have gone on probably a couple more years if it weren't for the fact that we could break uh, the codes of the Axis powers. And so governments form their attitudes about cryptography based on their experience in the outcomes of World War II and even World War I, uh, the, um, 
the Zimmerman telegram, which, by the way, is spelled with two N's, just, just so you know. Um, <laughs> one thing I like about Europe is that you know, more, people are more likely to spell my name correctly here. Um, so along comes the internet and it changes everything so that before the internet, the government tried to make the case that strong encryption was mainly in the purview of the government. It was something of a military technology. And when the internet came along, in order for us to benefit from the internet, we would have to use cryptography everywhere. And, and so there is a great social benefit to cryptography. And you can make that case without even, without even framing it as, as freedom of speech. I mean, you can also frame it as freedom of speech, but. Your secret, don't your secrets threaten me? The fact that I cannot know something about you is a risk to me, isn't it? You know, for a million years, um, people spoke to each other face to face. And anyone that wasn't standing right next to them could not hear them speak. And this was built into our nervous systems and our brains and our sensibilities for a million years. Always kind. Yeah, sure. Uh, but everybody has the expectation of privacy when they speak to each other for a million years. I mean a million years, not just a thousand. <laughs> This is how we evolved. This is how we felt comfortable and developed face our face. only face to face. And That's large secrets over over food. geological time. You know that it's all face to face. When we invented communications technology, it became possible to intercept our communications, and so I felt that uh, encryption was necessary to restore the the way of life that we had before. You know, that it is just common sense that you should be able to whisper in someone's ear, even if their ear is a thousand miles away. But this does not enhance the power of secrets. Cool. I'm sorry, it what? Next, next question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, first of all, um, I'd like to really, that was a really good answer because I realized um, you were in a, can you guys hear this? Yes? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, that's quite a bind I realized to be on the hook for the logical extension of the, the, the open source gun. And I think that's, they realize that's a very difficult question. I thought it's, it, was, it was a pretty good answer. Um, uh, and I'd also like to, I love the, um, I love that you say all conspiracy theories are, are false, even though as someone who was a professional statistician, I, I'm certain there must be one or two <laughs> somewhere in there. That, yeah. Yeah, it's just not the one that you believe in. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's, uh, that's great. I, there, there's something about Bitcoin that is very, you have to be, it's to be open to it, you have to be a kind of um, very independent thinker type person to kind of get your, your foot in the door. And then as a result, it's very easy for a lot of fringe stuff to kind of come along. So I've never heard that. I, that aspect of your life that people email you their conspiracy theories, I think is, is really fascinating. Um, but just to sort of change the gears a little bit, I, 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 you mentioned Hal Finney, and you know, since he's, he's no longer with us, and you know, I just um, I think maybe you know, he was, when Satoshi proposed Bitcoin, like basically everyone on the ma cryptography mailing list said that it was a terrible idea, except for him. He was like the only person to, to believe in it, and I was just wondering if uh, you, know, you, wanna, you could maybe talk about him a little bit or something, because you know, he's... Hal Finney was um, an uncommonly uh, kind person. Uh, he was uh, someone who was a, a privilege to know. Uh, he uh, w was he was sort of the Mr. Rogers of cryptography. Uh, he was a very kind-hearted soul. And he had an optimism about life that uh, he carried with him uh, through the duration of his disease. Um, I, I wish I could be as good as him. It, there, there, there is no God. It, if there was, 
uh, it wouldn't have happened to him. Um, so, yeah. Slightly other topic. Um, since the 80s, uh, crypto is available to everyone, and the government is spying on everyone. So, would in, would you feel that privacy improved or or not? No, privacy has eroded. Um, we have uh, developed advanced abilities to encrypt our communications, and we enjoy a, a wide variety of products that do that. Um, so in that one little area, things have gotten better. But in every other area, they've gotten much, much worse. Um, you know, when, when governments push back and they say, oh, we're going dark, you know, that's bullshit. What, what they mean by going dark is that um, they have this comprehensive view of the world through the golden age of surveillance. They're able to get surveillance information from cameras, you know, millions of cameras on the streets that have facial recognition algorithms behind them and can recognize everyone who walks by. And um, fusing data from many different sources, optical character recognition from traffic cameras to keep track of cars by their license plates. Um, data, transactional data, you know, credit card data, travel data, all of it fused together into a comprehensive total information awareness. It's like they have this vast display, this high resolution display, and there's just a tiny number of black pixels that are obscured by end-to-end -end encryption algorithms that we're holding on to. And they're pressing back against us saying, oh, they're going dark. I would like to hang on to these tiny number of black pixels in this vast high resolution display of surveillance that the governments enjoy. They aren't going dark. We should fight to hang on to these and we should try to roll back the surveillance technologies. We can't do it all with counter technologies. We have to do it in policy space as well. And that means, you know, we have to exert pressures on our on our parliaments and and um, you know, Europe has privacy commissions, so at least they have the sort of political apparatus, the bureaucratic apparatus uh, of, of something that tries to protect privacy. We should try to work with those privacy commissions to roll back uh, surveillance technology. Yes. Um, I have very little background in, in cryptography, and so I just wanted to understand uh, how safe has it, is it? And you've mentioned there are different versions, so I assume there have been issues from time to time. So could you say in terms of what kind of entities at those times had been able to, to crack the code? So are we talking about governments or, and, and how many? And, and how often did that happen? And was it a short period or was it prolonged? Well, um, people make mistakes when they write software. And so when the NSA uh, backed away from uh, trying to control cryptography in the 1990s, it's because they, they understood that they would have other opportunities to get what they need uh, without, um, without having to uh, break our encryption schemes computationally. Uh, they could inject malware into our routers, into our laptops, into our devices everywhere and, and, uh, and exfiltrate key material or put keyboard sniffers in to monitor our keystrokes and get our passphrases and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, a lot of the effort that NSA and other intel agencies around the world is about um, injecting malware. Uh, so it's not that they're breaking the encryption that they're just getting around it. If they can control the, the execution platform, then it doesn't matter how good your crypto is. They can exfiltrate the keys. Now, uh, but there is still another thing that we need to worry about as cryptographers, and that is quantum computers are coming. 
And uh, they're not here yet, but they will be. And maybe on the order of 10 years, maybe 15, you know, maybe 10, I, I don't know. Why but, would you say they're not here yet? Well, they're here on a smaller scale. I mean, there's, there's quantum computers that have like 50 qubits. That's not enough. Uh, IBM, Intel, and Google. There's public quantum computers that have 50. Next question. Yeah. Uh, OK. You asked, you, my question was going to be about quantum right. computing. You asked the first yeah, Wait, 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 just a moment. The NSA has issued public warnings to everyone to get ready for quantum computers. If you think they're secretly building a quantum computer that they've already got that can break through PGP or whatever it else, else it is, they would not be warning us. They would be sitting quietly at taking advantage of it. Why would they be doing that? Because they also want to protect American communications. But it's obvious, right, that they could already build one. So they, if they no, it's not so obvious. It is insanely difficult to if, build a quantum if computer. Would, if they would not pretend as if they, if they would tell their employees that they had it, it would leak. No, no, no. Look, they are issuing public statements, yeah, and, and so is NIST. Most saying, get ready for quantum computers. Quantum computers are coming. You better be ready because it's going to be really bad when they get here. It's going to be great for humanity because quantum computers can do really useful computations to run simulations of biological systems or chemistry or find miracle drugs. Does, but for does cryptographers, the NSA not have the budget. Nobody, nobody no, I, we don't know how to build quantum computers right now at, at the same scale. There's some fundamental physics problems that are very difficult. It is an applied physics problem that is starting to yield to, you know, determined engineering efforts. And I don't think the NSA has a quantum computer that can break currently deployed uh, encryption algorithms at, this, at the key sizes that are currently in use. Why not? Why not? Because it's incredibly difficult. There are a lot of other questions here. Yeah. I, I wanted, actually didn't even finish making my point about quantum computers. There's something you need to know about it. It's not that we have to worry today about quantum computers today. It's that we have to worry about intel agencies today intercepting our communications and archiving them in these vast facilities like in Utah where you have something that looks like the gigafactory full of disk drives. And they're archiving that, all the traffic today so that they can be cryptanalyzed in a decade when they have quantum computers. Our traffic today will be read by intel agencies later when quantum computers become available. Whatever year that is, they'll start looking at the most important traffic and trying to break it. And it's so easy for a quantum computer to break uh, public key algorithms in use today. Diffie-Hellman RSA, elliptic curve, all of the, those can, can be cut within seconds by a quantum computer, not days, seconds. And so we have to get ready, and we have to deploy replacement algorithms for the public key algorithms we're using right now. And so uh, digital signatures, we can still procrastinate that for a few more years because um, <clears throat> at some point before quantum computers arrive, if we finally get a, a digital signature algorithm that we like, we can go and find everything we ever signed, all the documents, check the signatures, see if they're still good, and replace them with fresh signatures with a better algorithm. But the key exchanges have to, we need it today. We need it, we need it yesterday. We have to deploy replacements for things like OpenPGP, TLS, OpenVPN, um, you know, WireGuard, um, every kind of public key uh, pro based protocol, we have to work hard today as fast as we can to replace the public key algorithms that are currently deployed with new ones. And it's not an easy thing because these keys are uncomfortably large and they don't even work the same way. Sometimes they require an extra round trip. So you can't just absolutely replace the old ones with the new ones. You have to change the state machine for the protocol that they're used in. And so this is something I've been working on. And NIST has a competition, you know, like the Advanced Encryption Standard competition in the late 90s, the SHA-3 competition a few years ago. Now, today, a competition to find um, the best candidate algorithms to re that, are, that are 
that could be used in, the, in, in a world where your opponent has quantum computers. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, these algorithms run on anything. You could run them on your smartphone, you could run them on your laptop. They're just algorithms. The, the post-quantum algorithms are math, math algorithms you can run on any computer. They, but they, they, the quantum computers, the, there's two algorithms that quantum computers can run that only quantum computers can run. One of them is Shor's algorithm, which is um, a way to uh, factor large uh, composite numbers or compute discrete logarithms. And if Shor's algorithm, be, um, well, Shor's algorithm can only run on a quantum computer. And so if someone builds a quantum computer of sufficient size, you can run Shor's algorithm and break the public key algorithms that we're using today at the key sizes that we're using today. And the other algorithm is, um, is um, Grover's algorithm. Now, Grover's algorithm reduces the key size effectively by uh, half. So the reason why the advanced encryption standard has 256 bits for the key, it actually has three key sizes, 128, 192, and 256. The reason why it has such a large key size, even though you only need about 128 bits to, to have you know, something that will take longer than the life of the universe to break, is because quantum computers reduce that to half as many bits. So we need a key space with 256 bits in order to achieve the, the work factor of 128 bits if you have a quantum computer. So that's why AES has such a large key size, because of uh, Grover's algorithm. We have so many questions here. Yeah, I, I yeah. just want to ask my question. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, my question was about quantum computing, and it's actually twofold. Firstly, Given your expertise in this field and uh, your seniority and uh, your contributions, who do you, th this is an educated guess of course, but who do you think is going to be most likely to first build quantum computers of this scale? And secondly, as, a, as an individual, as a, as, a per as a civilian, what are the steps I can take right now, if any, to prepare myself for this? this well, um, okay. Um the warnings we're getting from NSA is that, you know, um, for some years NSA had been promoting elliptic curve, elliptic curve DSA, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, and they're saying now, you know, don't put too much energy in these elliptic curve algorithms because what you should be doing, you should be spending all your time on right now, is replacing them with post-quantum algorithms because NSA is that worried. The NSA has a part, there's a part of NSA called the Information Assurance Directorate. I'm talking to you. Okay. The information. Wait. No. Wait. Wait. Yeah. You're right. Okay. The information. Okay. The Information Assurance Directorate is a part of the NSA that protects American communication. And um, I had a friend uh, who retired many years ago from uh, the IAD. His name was Brian Snow. Um, and Brian always wanted the IAD to split off from the rest of NSA and report up its own chain of command because that's where he worked. He was the most senior cryptographer there. And that's also the part of the NSA that issued these warnings uh, a couple years ago saying you better get ready for quantum computers. Unfortunately, just a few months ago, the IAD was absorbed into the rest of the NSA, so it kind of did the opposite of what Brian wanted. Um, but anyway, those people have the same sensibilities as we do. They protect uh, secrets. They, they're, they're not the ones that break the codes. They're the ones that, that you know, they have the same job as me. Um, so I don't know where I was going with this. Oh, so, you, yeah, it, so there's governments around the world. The Chinese are certainly working on quantum computers. Um, uh, probably all the major governments that have a lot of resources are doing it. Um, Intel is doing it, Google is doing it, and IBM is doing it. Those are the big three that are making the most progress. And their resources are, you know, uh, about the same as a government. 
Okay, there we go. Uh, I had a question on a totally different topic, and I, you know, I live in the United States uh, myself, and a lot of my friends use Venmo, and you were talking about the erosion of, of privacy. And when my friends use Venmo, when I signed up, you know, you can turn all the, the stuff off, but when my friends use Venmo, they literally, I can see all my friends, the, all the transactions that they've sent to anyone, they have it as a kind of social media, you know, it's all public, and I, you probably know what I mean, but I mean like literally, it yeah. will say like, Jeff paid, you know, Matt back 1250 for lunch or something, and it's just like, a whole, you can watch this whole stream of this, and I, I just kind of amazed. And that, that, that's, this, that's based on reading the blockchain, right? Well, see, that's the thing is that I kind of, you know, got into Bitcoin and, you know, I guess you kind of take your own perspective for granted or something. And, and most people are eager to volunteer. They, they find there's something shameful about keeping uh, a secret. But then, of course, as, you know, anyone familiar with cryptography knows, you are having a kind of ecological effect where it's like, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, actually, my, my, my concern about the ecological effects of Bitcoin is that uh, I don't want to boil the oceans. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, there, there yeah, is yeah. that. But the question is, like, you know, what, can we do anything about uh, culture, you know, for everyday people? Because what if, you know, it's, it, it doesn't really help if only 0.01% of the, of the world uses encryption. They're, they're just out and everyone else voluntarily... I think that what holds away. people back from using encryption is, is ease of use. I mean, PGP was always held back because of the cognitive burden. It's hard to explain to your mom the PGP trust model. But I was trying. To, I agree with that completely. But I also think it, it may be insufficient because when I'm the, in this Venmo case, it's true that it's like by default it has everything public. But I really think that even if you made something easy, see that's the case where it's as easy as just going to settings and clicking off a couple buttons. But people still feel compelled to share. They feel something in the culture. I think this is my conjecture. Something in the culture is just. You just feel compelled to just put all that, put all that out there. I don't, I don't, you know, can we do anything yeah, about I, that? Yeah, I, I would be reluctant to publish in a public ledger uh, everything that I purchased. You know, I, I don't mind my bank knowing that. I use, you know, my ATM card to make purchases. Uh, and I don't, you know, I, I would actually prefer the bank not know it either. But, uh, but, I, but I'm okay. I, you know, I've come to terms with the bank knowing that I'm, but I don't want it published in a public ledger, because then, you know, that's a huge gap. That's a that's a privacy breach. So, so Phil, you you just mentioned boiling the oceans. This is a guy to talk to because he's a creator of the side chain, the drive chain uh, concept. Uh, are you familiar with that? I, I've heard about this. I'd like to learn more about it. Although I don't know, is this is this is this the best time to explain it uh, in the? I would like to see I would like to see a talk with slides and animations uh, about that. He's speaking next. He's speaking next. Okay. You know, I, actually, as long as I'm standing here holding the mic, there's one more little beef thing I'd like to say. Um, lately, I've been getting more and more worried about uh, Facebook and other social media because I think that. The, the, because of their revenue model, uh, they're trying to optimize for engagement. They want you clicking on more and more stories and art and ads and stuff like that, and they draw you in. And nothing drives engagement as much as outrage. And, and so it's almost like an emergent behavior from these deep learning neural nets that are optimizing for engagement. And this means that they're optimizing for outrage. And that divides the body politic. It makes people angry. And when they're angry, when they go and vote, they, they try to solve the problem with voting for authoritarians. And so we, we should try to figure out a way to break out of this business model. It's killing us. It's destroying. The, you know, in a few days, there's going to be a meeting, a NATO meeting in Brussels. And it's quite possible that Trump's going to pull out of the US's NATO commitments to Article 5. And then, like, the next day, he's going to meet with Putin. And 
here's something you should all look for. No American president ever, besides Trump, has ever met one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with an, uh, a foreign head of state that is a hostile foreign power. There's always multiple translators and, and officials and note takers in the room keeping a record of the conversation because it's important. When Putin, when Trump meets with Putin, if he meets with him one-on-one -on -one with only a Russian translator in the room, a Russian translator, no American translator, just Trump as the only American in the room, Putin and a Russian translator, if that occurs, uh, that's Trump reporting to his handler. There's no reason for that kind of situation to, that's never happened in history with any other president. No president would ever meet with a hostile foreign leader without another American in the room taking notes. Yeah, I know, I know, it's conspiracy theory, but it's, I'm making, I, but the thing about conspiracy theories is that they're not falsifiable, okay? This one is. I'm predicting that when Trump meets with Putin, there will not be an American translator in the room. There will be no American note takers. There will be Putin, Trump, and a Russian translator. That's the, that's the prediction that I'm making based on this conspiracy theory. By law, he is. And so all of you watch the news and find out what happens. That's the predictive power of my conspiracy theory. And by the way, my conspiracy theory is, you know, <laughs> Like, everybody knows it, you know. <laughs> it's pretty obvious. So that's the predictive power of this. And by the way, it's already happened. And uh, Trump has already met with Putin with no other Americans in the room. It's hugely significant. If you have me the microphone every so often, I can shut up for the rest of the time. Okay, I'm saying I'm saying a lot of provocative things here. I I, I know that I'm I'm probably gonna I'm probably uh, gonna I'm, provoke. I'm interested the, in uh, learning uh, from you and uh, to see what I can get from this. But uh, what you're saying about uh, encryption and the need to develop secure encryption because of the quantum computing that's coming afterwards. The thing is, is that a lot a lot of this. So first of all, we have to understand why we develop the cryptography, why we develop the privacy technologies, is not just to uh, give everybody in the society a way to stay private, but it's to enable a political space in there for socio-political change to happen. Yeah, and, uh, you have to have um, privacy in your speech in order to have freedom of speech. Exactly. First, you have to talk freely about your political views with others of like mind to decide what you're going to Publish. Yeah, and it just happened that uh, most people don't have, don't talk about uh, political or, or, or things that have value to intelligence services, but by getting everybody to make, uh, to encrypt their communications, it provide, uh, it provide like a bigger, uh, bigger search space. So, um, but uh, what interests me about cryptography is the way that it can be used. So for example, encrypting speech is a very powerful uh, mechanism, but there are many other mechanisms that we can use, that we can imagine other ways that people could organize together, other ways that people could economically organize. And, um, and uh, for example, uh, Schnorr, I'm interested in what you think about uh, Schnorr signature scheme. It's a very simple signature scheme, but uh, with it, you could do aggregate public keys, and you could do an aggregate signature, which is very fast to compute between millions and millions of people, and that seems to have like really deep uh, socio-political implications. If a million people together could produce one signature for an asset or for some kind of decision making, uh, the, these can be used to construct. Uh, so, and also there's other things like uh, Diffie-Hellman and so on, but all these techniques, uh, maybe they can be broken more easily 
So like when we decide how to use these primitives, there's like other, there's like many different things that have to come into that. I usually try to custom build a, a, a crypto protocol to the way it's going to be used. And so, you know, there's all these different approaches to things and you can put them together to make uh, maybe a voting system or a consensus, a way of reaching consensus or to have, you know, secure VoIP between two humans and talking to, uh, a, between a human and a server or server to server, you, you know, you pick the, I think I've stood up here too long. There's other people waiting to speak. I have, I have one more question. Um, what one piece of advice would you give us young blockchain enthusiasts? Because you've been through a lot. Um. That's a good question. Uh, I don't know enough about where cryptocurrencies are going to go to make good suggestions for that. Um, as individual users, I don't know what to tell you. I, you know, I would like to see new cryptocurrencies emerge that don't use so much energy. Uh, but that's a matter for researchers to track down. I'll talk to you about the energy thing. Yeah. After. Who's next for the question? Anyone else? Um, Paul, we have time. All right. Oh no, I don't think we should. No. Yeah. No. Any? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Here we go. So, Paul, um, I don't know if you've recently seen the uh, open letter from the Amazon staff to Jeff Bezos basically saying that they should revoke the facial recognition and the Plantire intelligence project. And that's the staff members basically trying to put pressure on the corporates and I think something recently happened in Goo with Microsoft. Yeah. I want to see uh, what side of that argument do you stand on? Do you think that we should be putting pressure to try and stifle new technologies or do you think we should be trying to educate people on trying to use uh, old technologies to protect themselves? I, I would like to see some way to push back on surveillance technology and face recognition is an important part of that. Um, I, it, that technology has metastasized so much that trying to stop one company from doing it might not be very effective these days. If, if we'd started earlier and found somebody who was a pioneer in that area, maybe we could have slowed it down a little bit. Uh, but, you know, it's everywhere now. And, and what's going to happen in China is that um, we're going to have an authoritarian regime that perfects surveillance so much uh, that it's going to be impossible, it already is impossible to form any opposition. And they will have absolute control. There will be no political opposition in China. There just won't be. They're also combining that with other things like giving you a score about what, what a good citizen you are so that if you don't have a high enough score, you can't ride on the train or something like that. Um, China may perfect um, authoritarian rule to the point where other governments around the world want to start copying it. This is like a photographic negative of what happened with the United States pushing liberal democracies around the world after World War II. Seventy years of building up liberal democracies all over the world, rule of law, independent judiciary, free press, you know, due process, um, constitutions that protect minorities, you know, all these things that make up a, a liberal democracy um, were promoted all over the world. Uh, after World War II, 70, pe 70 million or 80 million people were dead and the world tried to figure out a way to not let that happen again. 
And so that was what happened for 70 years is the, the, the encouragement of liberal democracies in, in Western Europe and Japan and, and uh, uh, Australia and you know every 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 you know some of them already were liberal democracies, but but some countries were emerging from the war. They had come from oppressive governments, and and so you know the end of the Cold War and the bringing of liberal democracies to the Eastern Bloc. All this is in jeopardy now, and and a lot of that has to do with Russian intervention in Western democracies and their elections and their and their in their political culture. But also I think that um, as, as we you know, sort of perfected liberal democracy, it inspired other countries to embrace it. But what China's gonna do is, is gonna perfect authoritarian rule. And I think this is gonna be exported to other countries. And so you could have an immortal artificial intelligence that make sure that everybody toes the line. We have, they have a president for life in China now. Eventually he'll die, but the AI-backed uh, surveillance apparatus that he's building will keep everybody in a, in a state that is impossible for them to break out of. That's my, that's my dystopian fears. Do you not reckon that the advancement of technology and the reduction in price of surveillance equipment will eventually lead to a world where either we become more tolerant so that we can look at each other's lives without being offended and uh, maybe Phil, stuff, uh, do you, is that, you know you're talking about the uh, cryptography algorithms which can be broken by quantum computers. So does it, but like some of the algorithms, they offer really interesting properties like socio-political properties. And maybe there's like not a replacement with a quantum quantum secure algorithm. You're saying that are some of the things that we put together right now uh, I'm saying right are hard to are hard to replicate with uh, post quantum uh, equivalents? Yeah, because I, I, I don't know exactly what is needed to make things quantum resistant, but there's there's like people who build uh, cryptography algorithms to be secure. But then what's happening now in uh, blockchain, in cryptocurrency space, is there's a lot of really enthusiastic people. And before what was happening is there's a lot of academics and they're very specialized in many areas, but nobody's really put these things together before. And people are putting all of these different techniques together and finding uh, new different, it's not simply just for uh, money, but for other applications, for example, like how to secure uh, messaging between people about uh, uh, distribution of files inside of a computer system. Uh, I, you know, I, when I think about secure communications, I don't think of blockchain. I think I can find ways to securely communicate without blockchain. I, well, for example, uh, with IPFS, it's like a, it's a piece of software which doesn't depend on blockchain, but because of blockchain, it's now being made. This is stuff that in the 90s, people knew how to make, and people were even trying to make it, but there just simply wasn't the capital. And what's happened now with the geeks, or the hackers, is that basically they realize they can print their own money. And there's now a lot of capital, and it's going to a lot of really, um, a lot of silly projects, but there is also some capital going to projects before there just wasn't the money there to make. For example, PGP that was made in the 90s, you said that you, you had to go through six, you had to convince your bank that there were like six um, mortgages that you had to basically defend against. And that was just you and you made uh, PGP. But basically what we have now is an army of young, idealistic, enthusiastic programmers, and they're taking all of these cryptographic primitives, and they're putting them together in, in ways or different concepts that people never really thought before was possible. And what you're talking about now is that there is gonna be a, a breakthrough in quantum computing, and this breakthrough... Uh, yeah, so, so uh, the, the cryptocurrencies that we currently have that depend on uh, digital signatures, which many, you know, most of them have 
you have to sign something to make a transaction. Those digital signatures are in danger by quantum computers. Does it change, is it because of the algorithm or just the key size? It's just the algorithm. Making the keys bigger is not going to save the day. There are other signature schemes that are based on hashing that, uh, that we, can, we can make signature schemes that are resistant to quantum computers. And stack them with XORs. This is something you can't do with blocks on yeah, they, well, the signature schemes are, uh, you know, you have to read the papers. It's, I find the math pretty hard to follow. Um, I have a question uh, considering cryptocurrencies, uh, especially because a lot of uh, people are saying, well, when quantum computers are there, then the Bitcoin blockchain will be, uh, can be reversed, transactions, etc., can be undone. Um, and these are all experiments, right, in this space. So there's uh, one particular project, I think it's called Quantum Resistant Ledger that is able to do like uh, post-quantum cryptography and able to, they say at least, they are uh, quantum proof, but I, I, I don't there know. There are efforts to make um, cryptocurrencies that are resistant to quantum computers. And, and you know, eventually those things are gonna get deployed and maybe that's what we have to depend on. There's, you know, there's efforts to make in just better uh, cryptocurrencies. There's something uh, called, uh, what is it? Cardano, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That seems to have a lot of uh, careful, um, uh, careful, carefully constructed research behind it. That maybe that's going to lead to something. It solves, you know, it's like a third generation uh, cryptocurrency. But I don't think they're doing anything yet about um, quantum resistant signatures. I think that's something we're going to have to do. So eventually, uh, you're, you better dump your Bitcoin eventually, because uh, <laughs> when quantum computers arrive, they'll be able to. Um, we're, we're experiencing a kind of a renaissance or a lot of innovation in a, in a field of zero knowledge. And now, as Amir was ex expressing, there is some type of a financial incentive to pe for people to you know, change their behavior. And you know, Paul was alluding to, to, you know, some of that, what, what would accelerate, you know, people's getting more in the habit of using public key in, encryption, public and private keys, because there's an incentive attached to it. And Paul happens to be a, you know, a economist, so would know a little bit about incentives and, the, and behavior behind it. Mm -hmm. um, are you, I, um, are you able to, to predict a little bit with us in, into the future on, 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 I don't know, the types of zero knowledge applications that we might, you know, need to have in order to, to uh, protect ourselves, protect society? Well, as I understand it, you can use zero knowledge approaches to make these public ledgers uh, more opaque um, so, that, so that if you carry out transactions, not everybody can see what you're doing. That, that, that already exists now. We, yeah, yeah. That, that one's covered. And, yeah. so, and so now there's uh, you know, new, Which, kinds, new kinds of innovation where um, individual pieces of information, like selective disclosure, is, a, uh, you know, is something that's, that's, that's being implemented. But then there's the next, the next frontier, the next step into that is you know, what, what new types of zero knowledge algorithms um, do, you, do you think we, we should look forward to? Creating? I don't know. I, you know, I haven't put much effort into trying to design things for cryptocurrencies. Um, this, this, these examples, you know, that like selective disclosure, um, that that happens to be, um, you know, empowered by blockchain or distributed ledger, but it is very similar to PGP in that it is empowering individual privacy and security. Selective di disclosure, you don't have to yeah. reveal only right. Yeah. You know, I I don't I don't have the math background to do the 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 frontline research on this. You know, I I'm an applied cryptographer. I'm not a theoretician. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually asking about the from the application side. What what would you like to see? What would be on your wish wish list? Well, it would be nice to have uh, a a low cost, uh, low energy cost uh, cryptocurrency to do casual expenditures on, so that. My bank doesn't know where I had coffee this morning, or, or, you know, 
whatever it is that I'm paying for. And, and you know, that would just be nice because that's what we had in the days of cash. We don't use cash much these days. So it would be nice to restore what we enjoyed with cash. On the other hand, uh, I'm also worried about um, authoritarian regimes that are, that, are, um, uh, that are under sanctions using cryptocurrencies to evade the sanctions because I just am so much against authoritarian regimes. And I think the evil of authoritarian regimes is so compelling that you know if there's if they're under sanctions because they have done horrible things, then I'd like to figure out a way for those sanctions to work. So I have mixed feelings about uh, uh, authoritarian regimes uh, hate crypto more than the American government does. Okay, yeah, that's good <laughs> because we have crypto. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, cryptocurrency is not good for their economy. But we, a lot of people thought that uh, Iran or some of these regimes would maybe use cryptocurrency, but we've seen actually they've been the, the most strongest at shutting it down, whereas actually the West has been more permissive. So you're saying that the characteristics that make it uh, easy to evade sanctions also make it unattractive to these regimes Which because their own very, people will be able to carry yeah, out because things. Because they have unstable economic situation. They have to control the supply of money. They, they have well, to okay. Change the money as well. I, maybe so, but on the other hand, um, one could uh, set out to construct a uh, custom-built cryptocurrency that the, let's say, the government of Russia has some key material that no one else has that allow them to observe the opaqueness, they would be able to see into it and see what their citizens are doing while still enjoying the benefits of uh, using it to evade sanctions. I'm maybe going out on a limb here with that. I just kind of made that up on the spur of the moment, so it's probably not a well thought out idea. Well, go government can say est establishment, they, they're of course trying to create their own, you know, uh, a brand of this, the roll your own model, but say the open source ones that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. this is, I, I, will, I will emphasize uh, uh, what Amir is saying, yeah. right? Yeah, so in other words, uh, if we make ones that are open source, and, and or, or maybe even go to some extreme lengths to uh, generate the, um, the initial key material, like we saw uh, in Zcash, uh, then maybe that would be an attractive way to make it unpalatable to uh, authoritarian regimes. I don't know. I mean, which is more seductive to the authoritarian regime, the ability to, to bypass sanctions or the ability to see what their citizens are doing? Well, I, I think one of the interesting things about uh, cryptocurrencies is that even if authoritarian regimes create their own cryptocurrencies, people are still free to use the open source and public and yeah. uh, uh, blockchains. And that, that you know, I, th I think what, what Amir was referring to as well is, is Cryptocurrency enables people to freely transfer value without any censorship. And I think that, you know, that, that, that picks at the control of any authoritarian regime and, you know, promotes freedom. But obviously, uh, there's two sides of a coin when it comes to freedom, and sanctions is a, is a definite example of that. Yeah. I have been getting more involved with, with, uh, blockchain projects. I, there's a company in Switzerland that does metals trading, uh, industrial metals, copper, aluminum, nickel, you know. And they, they've been in business for 15 years doing metals trading, but all in the analog world. Everything is on paper. And they think that's slow and unwieldy, so they want to try to use the blockchain to s speed it up. Several projects that are actually already doing this today and have um, essentially tokenized things like gold and, and so forth. So it's actually, uh, there's several projects already doing this. Uh.
for them. I yeah. mentioned that. Uh, Digix DAOs. I, I'm example. always interested in finding other uses for this than simply cryptocurrencies. It's got to be other uses that, you know. But but there, there's not as many uses as a lot of people think. You know, when you take a closer look, it, the number doesn't is kind of a disappointing number. So uh, Phil, um, I want to thank you very much. I don't know if you want to have a like a parting uh, closing statement or two, but thank you very much from everyone. Yeah, I do want to make one more Please. thing. To, to answer your question, I worry about surveillance technology getting cheaper and more easily deployed, and I think it will lead to only bad things. So, yeah, I worry about that.